In Japan, during the Edo period, the military dictatorship sanctioned the building of enclosed pleasure quarters, known as yukaku. These walled, out-of-town districts offered a place for those who could afford it to indulge their sexual appetites, away from the prying eyes of wider society. There were many yukaku across the country, but Yoshiwara, which initially occupied the Tokyo district, now known Nihonbashi, was by far the most popular. For the elite, Yoshiwara's oiran were the ultimate status symbol. These skilled courtesans were treated like low-ranking nobility, and competition for their attentions was fierce and expensive. In addition to sexual favors, Oiran could sing, dance, play music, compose poetry, and produce calligraphy, or shodo. It is estimated that a customer could spend 3 to 5 million yen, the equivalent of about 30 to 50 thousand dollars in today's money, for the privilege of enjoying a single night with one of these iconic women. Although Oiran were the primary attraction, especially during the lavish evening parades to meet clients, known as Oiran Dochu, Yoshiwara boasted elegant shops, tea houses, and restaurants. The aim was to tempt even the most casual visitor to this very adult theme park to lavishly overspend. As a vibrant center of commercial and cultural activity, Yoshiwara Oiran exerted considerable influence over popular trends in fashion and art. But what was a typical day like for these women in the constant glare of the spotlight? What was life like inside the Yukaku house, the only place where they weren't permanently on display? At dawn, the gates of Yoshiwara were unbarred, and its captive clientele could come and go freely again. Prostitutes of all ranks would wake up around 6 a.m. to help overnight guests prepare for their return journey home and see them off with all the fuss and flattery necessary to attract repeat business. Oiran would then catch up on lost sleep in their private rooms until around 10 a.m. Everyone else would bed down together in a single, large room. The Yukaku owners maintained a brutal regime to encourage competition. What girls ate and where they slept were determined by rank and severe punishment was common for even a minor infringement of impossibly strict rules. When they woke up, they would all take a bath. Of course Oiran bathed first and the rest followed in the order of rank. Everyone was permitted to bathe every morning, but they were allowed to wash their hair only once a month, since safe, clean water was remarkably precious at that time. And, reconstructing the ornate hairstyles of Oiran was time-consuming, therefore a cost to be managed. After bathing, brunch was served. Oiran would eat in their private rooms, often taking deliveries from restaurants nearby. Even so, the typical menu was a bowl of rice, a bowl of miso soup, pickles, and one small portion of something more tasty. All the other girls, including apprentices, would eat their meals at a long narrow table on the ground floor. Despite long days of grueling labor, these girls between the age of 5 and 15 were lucky if they received a bowl of rice, pickles, and miso soup. It was not unknown for them to hoard leftovers from lavish client dinners and eat them for breakfast. The business of the day would begin from 12 noon. Apart from the established oiran, girls would sit in a wooden cage facing the street to attract passing customers. A practice known as hurry me say or display behind the grill. Meanwhile, Oiran would focus on self-improvement tasks, practicing their artistic skills, or reading books to enhance their conversational skills. Another important task for Oiran was to provide tuition to her Kimuro and Shinzo apprentices, who acted as overworked servants. 
Lessons would range, from how to dance or how to play an instrument, to the complexities of Yoshua etiquette, and the secrets of intimately satisfying high-value clients. If you'd like to know more about these girls, please watch our previous video about the cool path to becoming an Oiran. By 4 p.m., the daytime business was over. For the next two hours, until the evening business started at 6 p.m., the girls would fix their makeup and write letters to their customers. Letters were an essential sales tool for them. But this was especially true of the Oiran, because what they were selling was a glamorous, pseudo-romance. The compelling fantasy of highly cultured and soul-nurturing grand passion. These letters were a great way to assuage any guilt, felt by the wealthy male pillars of the Edo community, and lure them into investing heavily, in the fruitless pursuit of exclusivity. A tactic that is still very much alive, and well among Tokyo's many hosts and hostesses. At sundown, Yoshiwara would begin to come alive again. The girls would return to the cage and play shamisen, signaling that the house was open. Many artworks illustrate the ghostly beauty of these young prostitutes behind the lattice grill, illuminated by large paper lanterns. Next would come the Oiran Dochu. With her five to eight servants, including her Kamoro, Shinzo and manager, the Oiran, would parade to the Chaya, or tea house, to meet her customer. The Oiran had a distinctive way of walking, known as Soto Hachimanji. In conjunction with fashionable, platform guitar, this would turn a 10-minute stroll into a one-hour spectacle. After meeting at the tea house, the client would lead the lengthy parade back to the Yukaku, enjoying the kind of envious notoriety, equivalent to driving a Ferrari convertible through Monte Carlo, with a Hollywood star in the passenger seat. At 10 p.m., the main gates of Yoshiwara were closed, and barred. The law stipulated that this was the cue for Yukaku houses to close up for the night Yukaku, would extinguish their exterior lanterns to feign compliance. But unassigned girls were forced to sit in the lattice cage until midnight, and vocally attract customers in the dark. In the upstairs rooms of the Yukaku, the Oiran clients would be feasted and entertained until 2 a.m. in the morning, when a wooden clapper would sound. Finally it was time for bed. History tells us that customers would feel short-changed if they didn't get to enjoy the Oiran's full range of cultural accomplishments. But perhaps this is an attempt to retroactively downplay the baser instincts of rich and influential men. More recently, this included several prime ministers. In contrast to the Oiran and her client enjoying the privacy of her room, the other girls would take clients to the Mawashi Bayer. This was a murky communal area, where both prostitute and customer would almost certainly adopt the competitive spirit of the household, since sound traveled uninhibited, between folding paper and wood partitions. And after four hours of drunken fumbles, and stellar ego massaging, it was time to begin a new day. Working 17 hours in 24, without time off for weekends, holidays or what passed for good behavior, it is little wonder that so many of Yoshiura's prostitutes died prematurely. Their corpses were dumped in the middle of the night, at one of the many throw-in temples, nearby, such as Jokunji or Saihoji, and buried as paupers without relatives. Like the nearby city of Edo, Yoshiura was a cluster of wood and paper buildings, in close proximity, and liable to a serious conflagration. But within the walls of the pleasure quarter, the combination of paper lanterns, heavy drinking and systemic abuse of underage girls, was a perfect recipe for disaster. It's not difficult to imagine that for frightened young girls, arson offered a desperate route to escape abuse, at least for a while. 
It should come as no surprise then, that Yoshua burnt to the ground, at least 18 times, between 1617 and its abolition, just 70 or 80 years ago. Support for the repeated reconstruction of Yoshua came from a predictable source. Yukaku houses received significant loans from moneylenders, supported by the shogunate, and also paid a portion of their profits back to the government as protection money. Historical documents from 1868 show that 12% of the income of the town magistrate's office came from such payments, despite the fact that Yoshua was in decline due to the rise of geisha. The prostitution business was also a very important source of funds. Appearances can be deceptive, especially in Japan. Many people assume that the glamorous reputation of Oiran implies that they were happier than ordinary women. What do you think? Of course, the product line of modern department stores doesn't include underage girls in gilded cages, although the otaku district of Okihabara comes as close as the law will allow. And you can still see proud reenactments of the Soto Hachimanji parades for tourists, and witness Japan's lingering fascination with sexualized underage girls in the idol culture of carefully manufactured girl bands. Is abuse more acceptable when it comes with cultural baggage and side order of cosplay? Share your feelings in the comments section below. Thank you for watching, and please consider subscribing. Next time, we'll explore the life stories of history's most famous Oiran, and look more closely at whether they enjoyed happier lives than ordinary women.